DNA was a game changer for law enforcement when it first allowed them to match evidence to suspects. That's now expanded thanks to widespread voluntary DNA testing among the general population and rigorous police work. It's called genetic genealogy, and it's cracking cold cases and catching killers who until now were getting away with it. With us to explain how it all works, let's welcome in West Haven, Connecticut, Claire Glynn, Associate Professor of Forensic Science at the Henry C. Lee College of Criminal Justice and Forensic Sciences at the University of New Haven. And here in our studio, Patricia Kosim, Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. She's a former member of the RCMP's National DNA Advisory Committee and is also host of the Info Matters podcast. Ellen White, investigator at Pulse Private Investigations and host of the podcast Whereabouts Unknown. And Jennifer Pagliaro, crime reporter at the Toronto Star. And it's great to have you three with us here in the studio. And Claire Glenn, thanks for being there on the line from New Haven, Connecticut for us. Let's start with this. JPEGs, set this up for us. What's significant about the most recent arrest about a cold case? So what's interesting about these cases is that you often have families waiting decades for answers. You know, when police put something on the cold case list, there's not always a lot of hope that these are going to be resolved and these families will get any sense of, you know, closure. Although, what kind of closure can there be in a case like this? This most recent case, there were two women, both killed within months of each other in 1983 in Toronto. It was sensational at the time. It was all over the headlines, on TV. And once DNA had advanced enough, we could see that there was potentially one suspect responsible for both of these cases. But DNA hadn't advanced enough for us to know who that person was. And so it remained cold for these remaining years until most recently, Toronto police were able to get a match, not off of what we call the offenders data bank, but an entirely different pool of people that led them to one man who they say is responsible for both murders. And of course, it's been almost 40 years and everybody assumes it'll never be solved, right? Exactly. So again, when this comes back into the news, it's it's always uh, a, a shock, I think, because you never actually expect some of these cases to be solved. But I think the way that technology is going, we can expect more of these cases to be solved. And that's why we're here. I think it's so fascinating. Gotcha. Okay, Claire, come on in here and help us understand how this actually works. Because once you've got the DNA information, from a crime scene or from unidentified remains. Okay, what happens next? Sure, well, um, for the last 30 plus years, we've been using a technique called forensic STR typing. So STR stands for short tandem repeat. And that's the methodology that we've been using for about 30 plus years since the mid 1980s. And that's like essentially a barcode of a person's DNA. And uh, as was just mentioned, these offender data banks of DNA exist in most uh, countries. And those are uh, data files or reference DNA profiles of people that have been previously convicted of a crime. And so for years, we've been collecting biological evidence from crime scenes and uh, STR typing them and then checking them against the uh, offender data banks here in the United States, it's CODIS, um, and we look for a match. And while that has had a huge amount of success for years um, and has solved many, many crimes, now we've gone even further where we're uh, searching databases, genetic genealogy databases uh, uh, that voluntarily people have uploaded their DNA to after testing with, say, a direct-to-consumer uh, DNA testing company like Ancestry or 23andMe. And at the moment, we're only able to use uh, two genetic genealogy databases, that's Family Tree DNA and also GEDmatch. And these are places that uh, the users have consented to their DNA being available and being compared to it. Okay, so hold with, off on that. We're going we're to come back to this angle of it in a little bit. But I want to first f find out, take 30 seconds and tell me what you do. What does your outfit do? Yes, yeah, so we're private investigators and we've been around for a number of years. Um, we work on all kinds of different cases, everything from child custody matters to traffic accidents, but we do tend to specialize in uh, suspicious death investigations and of course missing person investigations. And do you do this? 
We do that indirectly. We certainly aren't scientists, but we use that very practical application, uh, you know, as, as was just discussed, in solving cases. We may have somebody reach out to us who is um, a Holocaust survivor. They want to find their family. Somebody who is um, not sure of their, their parentage. They want to find their family. We would use it for that very practical application. But what we've seen in recent years, we're using it in unsolved sexual assaults, unsolved homicides, and to identify human remains. Hmm. All right, all of this now being on the record, we come to the Information and Privacy Commissioners to tell us this is all pretty new. Do we have regulations and laws that govern how all this happens yet? Actually, we don't. So the National DNA Data Bank, um, that was, that's our Canadian equivalent to the CODIS Data Bank that was uh, referred to earlier uh, in the US, has some pretty strict rules about uh, whose DNA gets into the bank. It's only convicted offenders of serious offenses. Uh, there are rules around you know, the fact that it's only a profile, it's not the whole genome sequence, it's only certain markers, a limited number of markers. Uh, identified information is kept separate from the profiles. Uh, there are strict rules around exact data matching. This so is in the States, you're this, saying? Uh, here in Canada. This is here, okay. Yeah, you, there are exact rules around <laughs> data matching, so only a perfect match can then be referred back to the investigator from the National DNA Data Bank, and there are strict rules around retention. So uh, people exonerated of crimes, for instance, uh, are in, entitled to be removed from the uh, offender's database. Um, all these rules exist on these forensic data banks, but none of them exist when you're talking about these websites or platforms that upload genetic information or DNA information for recreational genetic genealogy purposes. So we're behind? Oh, yes. We need to get in the game here, I guess is what <laughs> I hear need, you saying. We need to put some guardrails around mm -hmm. them. Um, everybody, I think, in this uh, studio and uh, at home will agree that these many of these cases are really compelling and important to resolve and to you know for the for to resolve for the families to exonerate wrongfully accused people um, to feel safer as a society as a public knowing that uh, these people are being accountable and will be put away for horrific crimes and hopefully stop from repeating them so for all these compelling reasons i think it's important to explore what uh, could be done what should be done but most importantly what are the guardrails so that we make sure we don't um, go overboard in terms of privacy invasions and uh, incursions on civil liberties. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, I mean, we're talking about this like it's brand new, but in fact, I guess genetic genealogy does go back a bit, right? How far back does it go? Yeah, it does. I mean, I'm sure that viewers will remember seeing like the popularity of these ads, like the sites that Claire mentioned, 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Uh, interestingly, Toronto P police got turned on to this area when they saw what happened with the Golden State Killer in California, which is a case that Canadians will probably know because, again, so sensational the way it was was covered. How many years ago was that? Uh, that was, uh, someone help me, Ellen. That was. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so that, that was relatively recently, but, but 23andMe and Ancestry.com have existed uh, in terms of trying to connect with your family tree even longer than that. I think actually swabbing yourself and those at-home kits are relatively new inventions in the, in the, the long history of DNA. Um, but it, it really presents, I think, a lot of really interesting ethical challenges and it it isn't something that I think that we've begun to grapple with in well, terms of legality. Do you want to follow up on that in terms of consent? I mean, where are we on consent these days? Well, this is a really important issue because many of the people um, who upload their DNA that's been sequenced onto these recreational genealogy uh, platforms, they do so on the basis that they want to create and find out about their family tree. They want to find out more about their ancestry, who they're related to. And um, they do so on the basis that they consent. They consent to upload and to be um, you know, given information about people with whom they match or partially match and may be uh, related to. 
Uh, the interesting thing is when they give consent, of course, they're not giving consent only to their own personal information. By virtue of genetic information, you're basically consenting to your family information being uploaded yeah. and shared and matched. So it is, there's a complexity to genetic information where consent really breaks down and can't really give full authorization on behalf of family members. So um, until recently, until recently, a couple of years ago, some of these platforms were cooperating with law enforcement and, and providing samples um, in, and information. Uh, until there was some public backlash, and now they only do so with the express, or they're supposed to only do so with the express opt-in consent, in Actually, other words. Actually, you know what? I got all that here. Well, Should there we put you all go. That? Let, let, let's get all this on the record here right now. In a statement from 23andMe, a spokesperson said, it has never given a customer's genetic or personal information to law enforcement. That's what they say. If a customer wants to share with law enforcement, <laughs> they must do so directly. On its website, it will not release any personal information to law enforcement unless legally required to do so. It will notify the user unless prohibited by law. According to its website, Ancestry DNA does not voluntarily release personal information to law enforcement unless legally requested, and it will provide notice to users unless prohibited by law. Next one. Jedmatch is one that can be used by law enforcement. It allows users to upload profiles from other sites and to summarize, Jedmatch says it is policy to never provide data or information to third parties, and it has four privacy options. Let me just briefly go through these. There's private, opt-in, opt-out, and research. Opt-in means user kits will also compared with kits also be compared with kits submitted by law enforcement for unidentified human remains and perpetrators of violent crimes. Opt-out means kits can be compared for unidentified human remains but will not be compared for perpetrators of violent crimes. Family tree DNA also protects your information from third parties and it allows limited access law enforcement accounts. And users will only be viewable to a law enforcement account if the user has opted into matching, has not opted out of investigative genetic genealogy matching, the user and the law enforcement account have the same matching level selected. The user is a genetic relative to the genetic file uploaded to the law enforcement account. Okay, that's a lot of information there, but it's now all on the record. What do you like, what don't you like about what you've just heard? So many interesting things, and as you described it, it's almost a bit of a wild west in terms of what you can and can't do right now with the information. We have concerns around uh, some of the ways that it might be collected and submitted. Uh, as an example, we have families come to us with um, people they've befriended who are living in, in nursing homes, and that person might be in end stages, they want to find their family. So their friend, their helpful friend who's just met them, will go ahead and purchase a kit, upload that information for them, tick all the boxes. There isn't any guarantee that the person completing that is actually the person whose sample you're submitting. So we can see a bit of a disconnect there. I think so far with, um, with what's happened in the, in the charges in the court process in Canada, we haven't really seen a challenge to it. We've had people who, once their identity was determined, they've already passed or once their identity was determined through genetic genealogy, they've entered a guilty plea. We're going to see in February of 2023 when the Stephen Wright case comes to trial, Stephen Wright was um, charged based on the collection of genetic genealogy of uh, a murder of an 18-year-old person um, many, many years back. He has decided to enter a not guilty plea. What jurisdiction so, is this in? That is, he is uh, out of, he was charged at the North Bay Regional Health Center, okay. so where he was an employee. Um, but the murder actually is said to have happened in Sudbury, Ontario. So we expect it's going to be heard in North Bay, but we're curious to see what is his defense lawyer suggesting? What's that strategy going to be? It would appear that on the face of it, genetic genealogy has got him dead to rights. Hmm. But obviously there's something there that makes his defense think that they can, they can mount a not guilty challenge. So we're going to see then, see how that unfolds. I think it will be the first in Canada. That'll be next February. February of 2023. Okay. Claire, give us the view from south of the border. How, uh, what do you like, what don't you like about what you've just heard? 
Well, I mean, I think the uh, incredible success that forensic genetic genealogy has had, particularly in the United States, was well over 500 cases resolved uh, through its use so far. Um, I think it's amazing that we're able to use genetic data like this and the advances in the technologies over the last number of years and the access to family tree DNA and the access to GEDmatch is incredible. Um, what I hope for the future with it, though, is that uh, we do put those guardrails in place. And that's uh, uh, occurring here in the United States with policies being developed. And it's policies from a number of different uh, facets of this process. It's who conducts this research, who conducts the searching themselves. Are they trained? Are they uh, knowledgeable in this area? They, do they understand uh, the uh, uh, restrictions that do exist in terms of what databases you are allowed to upload, who owns the data that's generated from this. Um, so I think that I, I totally agree that we definitely need guardrails on an international level um, uh, to protect the use of it, but also to protect public safety. Uh, but also to protect public uh, privacy and individuals privacy also. Jennifer, what are you hearing about how up on all of this we are here in Canada. Yeah, I think that people are still very uninformed about some of the protections that are and aren't in place. I keep thinking about whoever the family member is who uploaded their data to GD Match, who is the way that Toronto police track down the man responsible for the murders uh, of Susan Tice and Aaron Gilmore in 1983. Um, because, you know, I was talking to Ellen about this earlier. A lot of people who are using these at home kits are well meaning citizens. Perhaps they're doing research on their own family tree, they're estranged from their family, and they're looking for that connection. And they're not really thinking that they're going to be participating in a murder investigation. They're not thinking they're going to participate in a murder investigation. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know what it's like for that person sitting at home who uh, is, is in some way responsible for a distant relative, cousin maybe, uh, being arrested and, and potentially spending the rest of their life in prison 40 years later. Mm. Commissioner, you heard all of those different on that laundry list. You know, you've got private, you've got opt-in, opt-out, research. Are you satisfied there are adequate guardrails in place here to protect people? No. What's the problem? Uh, for, first of all, it's awfully complicated, isn't it? Um, that whole machination of who's in, who's out, what, what you're opting in for, what you're opting out for. And that's when you've re read the fine print, you understand the implications of uploading your information. Um, but again, um, even in the, you know, the most perfect case where you understand all that and go into it willingly, your family members have not. And that's, that's the implication here, the real privacy implication, is that your innocent family members become implicated in what happens after. So say they have a partial match. They find, they upload the crime scene DNA onto one of these platforms. They find a partial match. They know it's a relative. Then they will hand it over to expert genealogists who are expert in the science of putting together the family tree. And in the case of Aaron Gilmore and Susan Tice, we heard from the investigators that involved hundreds of members of the family. Um, and because they had traced it back to common great grandparents. So you could imagine in large families uh, how many people are involved. And slowly, through investigative techniques, they whittle down and they narrow down. Uh, and, and, and start to whittle down the potential suspects. But in that process of whittling down, they're really s conducting surveillance on many of these innocent family members. So what I mean by that is they, they might question them or they might not, they might surveil them. Um, sometimes they might ask for their consent to voluntarily give a, a confirming uh, DNA sample so they could um, confirm even though they know it's a, it's an innocent person, it's not the suspect because you're looking for a male and let's say this is a female, they need your DNA to exclude, say, a whole side of the family and therefore further whittle down. Now, they could ask for consent or, you know, it could be a lot easier just to pick up a discarded Tim Hortons cup 
or a pizza crust or a piece of gum mm -hmm. and, uh, and get your um, confirming DNA that way. And that's what's concerning is that there are no rules around this genetic surveillance of family members. The most, if not with the exception of one, turn out to be innocent family members mm. uh, that come under this guise of added surveillance. And I think there have to be rules and guardrails around how far investigators can go in whittling down that tree. Claire, let me get um, let me get you on the competing interests that are at play here, though. On the one hand, you know there are families who have been suffering for decades and need to know they need they need to know justice as possible. On the other hand, we don't want to put a whole bunch of people under suspicion who ought not to be and disregard civil rights, which ought not to be disregarded either. How do we square that circle? Well, it's putting those guardrails in place and having uh, rules for, uh, as was just said, the kind of collection of DNA from innocent people. Whenever we're working a FGG case, a forensic genetic genealogy case, and you get that uh, DNA match of the genetic relative in the database. You build out the family tree from that person. And you're basically putting this jigsaw puzzle together using traditional genealogical methods to build backwards in time the family tree. But all of that information is all publicly available information like birth records, marriage records, um, and other civil uh, registration records that's publicly available, even obituaries. Whenever we get to the point of we've identified a living family member of that person that we might want to uh, get DNA sample from them to, we refer to them as target testers or reference testers to uh, then confirm are we in the right direction? Are we in the right branch of the family tree? I think definitely rules have to be in place there that it shouldn't be covertly collected DNA from that individual because we they're, they're known to be innocent, so covert collection wouldn't be a, a appropriate there. So a rule in place there where uh, written informed consent uh, should be uh, derived from that person. Um, and those are the types of rules that we are putting in place here in the United States. Um, and I think if we all work together on an international level to really fine tune every single piece of uh, this process, we could come up with some uh, pretty robust uh, rules that would protect everybody. Ellen, where do you think we should put the accent here? We have, on the one hand, families who want justice. On the other hand, people who worry about abuses. What yeah, do we do? Absolutely. I mean, there's so much There's so much good to the program. I mean, there's so many things that can be accomplished because of it. Not only, as we mentioned, you know, so many convictions that um, can happen as a result of the, the collection of that DNA, but also wrongful convictions that can be overturned. So is there definitely, are there a whole lot of, you know, boxes checked in the, in the pros column? Definitely. I think it's really essential, though, to, you know, as we were just discussing, looking at ways that we can safeguard the rights of people who are really just not involved. I'm not familiar with the case in Canada where somebody's DNA, a family member, where their DNA was was uh, collected covertly. Um, from what we're hearing, people are approached saying, you know, your, your name has come up in this investigation. We'd like you to provide a sample. They've done so willingly. That's certainly one thing. I have absolutely no problem with that. And then, of course, it's narrowed down. People are excluded. You have your, your perpetrator as the last person standing and the last person to be tested. I think that that's okay. I think that there have to be protections in place all along. Um, my prediction would be that in the way the system is functioning currently, we may have a whole lot of cases either resulting in no convictions or resulting in cases being overturned on appeal. So just tightening up that process, making it as fair as we can for everybody, is only going to give us that best result. Okay, but knowing people are people and knowing mistakes can happen yes. and knowing no institution is fail-safe, if somebody, Absolutely. I don't want to make this too personal, but if somebody approached you and said, give us a sample of your DNA so we can rule you out from this awful situation that's happened, would you provide it? Um, I personally would provide it, but I also get where people who might have been, uh, had previous conflicts with the criminal justice system, people who might have had previous conflicts with government or just coming from a culture that is not trusting of government may say, no way, I'm not doing it. I also feel that when people are reading through the terms and conditions, you know, when they're using a direct-to-consumer product, um, they're getting very hesitant about that. They're thinking, how could this be used against me? And I think it's probably human nature to think that way. So I personally would. I'm going to say that it's my opinion that the majority of people would not, if they were fully informed, would say, I don't want to go there. This has nothing to do with me. I know I didn't kill anybody, and I'm pretty sure nobody in my family did. That's always the thought or the hope. I'm just not going to participate. Jennifer, how about that? 
the room for error here? Is it significant enough to make people pause? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, on top of um, guardrails, which I think we should certainly be talking about as there seem to not be any, uh, there's also the legal process, right, where uh, I believe uh, Ellen told me about a case where uh, police narrowed down the suspects to two brothers. And we have two brothers, uh, maybe Claire can help us with this, you know, that's pretty similar uh, genetic material. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it comes down to classic in investigative work, but that's really up to the legal system. Like, did you get the right brother? Did you get the right sibling? Um, does the other sibling have an alibi? Uh, and we know that people are still being wrongly convicted, even with uh, DNA evidence mm -hmm. in place. And we have to also be challenging the justice system to be rising to the occasion of this new technology to make sure that prosecutors and defense lawyers are prepared to try these cases fairly uh, and that judges are aware of the limitations of the technology and of like genealogy in general um, in order to make sure that people get a fair trial right. uh, when it does come to that. Claire, you want to come in on that? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, in an investigation, an FGG investigation, when we reach a potential candidate identity at the end, and in that particular case of two brothers, it's one of the two brothers, uh, in every FGG investigation, before any arrest is made, you confirm it with that uh, forensic STR profile, so the uh, method that we've been using for 30 years. So the STR profile would tell us which brother it actually is. Um, and that's one of the rules that definitely needs to be in the, in the policies going forward that um, uh, STR profile confirmation has to occur prior to any arrests is being made. You certainly can't be making arrests just based on the genealogical research that's been done uh, because you could have gone down the wrong branch and you could be in the wrong side of a tree and uh, uh, generate a, an incorrect uh, candidate identity, which I'm sure has occurred. We just haven't heard about it. Commissioner. So uh, I just have a, a couple of comments. Um, interesting, we, we do know that uh, there, there are cases that have been reported, um, certainly south of the border, that have used covert surveillance over uh, family members in order to whittle down that tree. Um, it's interesting, uh, Ellen, you said we don't know of any case in Canada. You're right, we don't know of any case in Canada. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, because there's no transparency around exactly. this, of course. And so there's much we don't know. And um, it, there is every possibility that that is being done. And that's that's part of the issue is there's no accountability or transparency because there's no rules around these um, processes. Um, you know, I think it's very fair to say, and, and you know, we, we should rely on the justice system to give the accuse their day in court to be able to challenge these uh, processes, these investigative procedures, and to be able to really test it against our privacy laws in Canada, against our charter, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we will see that process play out in a, non a number of cases in the coming year or so. Um, but family members who were part of that whittling down will not get their day in court. In fact, many of them will yes. never know that they were actually covertly um, involved and never told, or some of them who were approached and asked to voluntarily give their consent may feel obliged to, because if they yes. don't, then they'll feel like they're a suspect mm -hmm. and feel that, um, you know, they don't want any trouble with the law, so unwittingly or unwillingly give their sample. Um, but I want to raise another point that even when investigators approach family members to seek their voluntary consent to give a sample, a reference sample, as Claire um, called it. Um, you know, sometimes, and there have been cases where in that process there have been inadvertent disclosures. Such as? Uh, about family members or relationships that the individual who answers the door to the law enforcement officer didn't know they had. Hmm. That they were not the biological child of the parents they thought they were. Uh, that they were not the sibling, or they had a long-lost sibling, and in one case in the U.S. Um, that uh, uh, w uh, was talked about on, on a podcast I did on this very issue by Dr. Uh, Frederick Bieber, he mentioned uh, a really real case where a, f a brother and sister um, did voluntarily upload their DNA only to find out that they were not the uh, children of the parents they knew. In fact, they were the 
the product of their fertility doctor who inseminated their mother unknowingly uh, at the time who was uh, seeking uh, assistance with reproductive uh, technology and was um, inseminated with the fertility doctor's uh, DNA as part of the um, in vitro fertilization process. It's a heck of a way to it, find that and, out. And it is. And yeah. unfortunately, I mean, the, the people suffer traumatic stress finding out yeah. things about themselves that they never asked to know. <laughs> they never, you know, they have the right not to know. These are people that would never have imagined swabbing themselves for 23 and Me, right? And now there's a police officer at their door. You can imagine, like, you know, I've been I've been thinking about these situations like around the dinner table, what that looks like. I think um, I don't know that folks, you know, signing up for their uh, at home kit are thinking about the far out consequences of that. Knock on the door. Let's get another voice into this just in our remaining moments here. Michael Arntfield, criminologist, author, Western University, has been on this program before, joined us earlier this year. DNA evidence and <clears throat> excuse me, DNA evidence and detective work. Here's what he has to say about that. It's sort of there's DNA. Wait for um, wait for the check to clear. Basically, um, that leads to a blunting again of I think the instinctual uh, investigative work that was done in the past. I give some examples of some cold case task forces that uh, had no DNA and again returned to uh, good old fashioned detective work. Now I should qualify that genomics or familial DNA. Uh, is an absolute game changer. And this technology is changing by uh, the week, uh, so much so that they're now referring to the DNA data bank the police have traditionally relied on as um, legacy DNA technologies because uh, the future is in uh, leveraging, again, family trees through these private labs. Michael Arnfield from Western University. Okay, Claire, where do you see this all going? Uh, well, I see it expanding worldwide, and I see more and more countries uh, investing in this new technology um, and putting their policies in place. Australia have begun to use it now. England, Ireland are starting to use it also. Um, in terms of its widespread use, I do think it will... Uh, come outside of the kind of private industry and move more back into the government labs where the testing uh, and the SNP sequencing, which is what generates the data that we need, I think that will come back into the crime lab uh, arena. And I, uh, through my program at the University of New Haven, I have a large amount of uh, forensic DNA scientists and also law enforcement professionals that are uh, in my program who are learning this technique and they're uh, developing the skills to be able to carry it out in-house within their agencies because at the moment we do have quite a lot of private companies uh, that offer their services for uh, conducting this type of investigation uh, but we're seeing law enforcement agencies themselves and crime labs themselves and the scientists from there uh, learning this technique so that they can be doing it in-house as opposed to the hiring of private uh, companies for it. I do hope for the future though with uh, GEDmatch and with Family Tree DNA that more members of the public do uh, learn about this and consent to it and upload their DNA to it. Because the more people that we have in GEDmatch and in Family Tree DNA, the better success that we can have with uh, this technique because the more matches that we will have. Ellen, last 30 seconds to you. What's the future? Yes, very important point that Claire just mentioned regarding the future. We're seeing now in GEDmatch about 75% of the um, people who are involved in the program are of Northern European descent. So the program rules out a whole lot of different categories and demographics that we really need to see in there. We think that the, the cost of the um, direct-to-consumer package may be a bit expensive. In the U.S., you can go ahead and upload to GEDmatch for $14.95 uh, through their DNA Solves program. You can't do that in Canada. In future, we would love to see the program be more more accessible to more people, it's going to give a much broader result. Um, we think that's going to happen ultimately, whether there's intervention by government. Ministry of uh, the Solicitor General has just announced funding to test 30 cold cases each year for the next three years. Hmm. That can only be beneficial to us as well. You have all given us a lot to think about here tonight on TVO, and I want to thank you all. Claire Glynn at the University of New Haven in Connecticut, Patricia Cosim, the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, Jennifer Pagliaro, the crime reporter at the Toronto Star, Ellen White, investigator at Pulse Private Investigations, host of the podcast Whereabouts Unknown. 
I want to thank all of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.